the sort of family attitude, certainly on, on matters of sex, it was morbid, morbidly puritanical. Well, did you then, in fact, have a feeling of guilt about sex? No, well, I don't know. Not, I don't think I had much occasion to, no. <laughs> well, now, let's turn to your schooling. What sort of learning at that age did you, for instance, study the classics? Uh, well, to a certain degree, I was never fond of the classics. I mean, mathematics was what I liked. My first lesson in mathematics I had from my brother, who started me on Euclid. And I thought it was the lovely stuff I'd ever seen in my life. I didn't know there was anything so nice in the world. Can you remember and tell us about that first Oh, lesson? yes, I remember it very well. But uh, I remember that it was a disappointment because he said, now we start with axioms. And I said, what are they? And he said, oh, they're things you've got to admit, although we can't prove them. So I said, why should I admit them if you can't prove them? And he said, well, if you won't, we can't go on. And I wanted to see how it went on, so I admitted them pro tem. Now, what was it that first uh, provided you with the incentive to become a mathematician? I liked it, well, for a number of reasons. In the first place, the sheer pleasure, which was the sort that people get from music or from poetry, just it, it, it delighted me. Then, apart from that, I thought that uh, mathematics was the key to understanding the universe. And uh, I found all sorts of everyday things explained by means of mathematics. Have you found on the whole in your own life that the pursuit of either mathematics or philosophy has given you a, some sort of substitute for religious emotion? Yes, it uh, certainly did. Uh, I mean, uh, oh, well, until I was about uh, 40, I should think, I got uh, the sort of satisfaction that Plato says you can get out of mathematics. It was an eternal world, it was a timeless world. It was a world where there was a possibility of a certain kind of perfection. And uh, I certainly got uh, something analogous to religious satisfaction out of it. Um, what uh, period of your life, or rather what episode in your life, led you to turn again from philosophy, to some extent, into social work and politics? Oh, the First War. The first war made me think it, it just won't do to live in an ivory tower. This world is too bad, we must notice it. Were you a moral pacifist, or was it merely that the war seemed to you to be inexpedient and unnecessary? I thought, as a politician, and I still think, that it would have been very much better for the world if uh, Britain had remained neutral and the Germans had won a quick victory. We should not have had either the Nazis or the Communists if that had happened. Because they, they were both products of the First World War. The war would have been brief, there would have been nothing like so much destruction. I still think that that is valid, that is speaking as a politician. Uh, speaking as a human being, I used to uh, have occasion to go to Waterloo and there I would see troop trains going off, filled with uh, young men who were almost sure to be slaughtered. And I, I couldn't bear it. It was too horrible. How much, in fact, did you actively campaign against it? Oh, as much as I could. I went all over the place making speeches. And uh, I did everything I could to help the conscientious objectors. I wrote about it everywhere where I could. No, I did everything I could think of to do. Uh, did you have a uh, sort of public notoriety as an unpopular figure, or were you regarded as just a, a, a crank? I wasn't actually pelted with rotten eggs, but I had an almost worse experience. Uh, I was uh, at a meeting of pacifists at the Southgate Brotherhood Church, and uh, it was stormed by a mixture of colonial troops and uh, drunken viragos. The drunken viragos came in bearing boards full of rusty nails with which they tamped everybody on the head. And the uh, colonial soldiers looked on and applauded them. And the police looked on and did nothing. 
and the women had all that clothes torn off their backs and were badly mauled and so forth and so on. And uh, the Viregos and the Rusty Nails were just about to attack me and I didn't quite know what one did about this. When uh, somebody went up to the police and said, look, you really ought to stop these women, you know, he's a distinguished writer. Oh, it's the police. Yes, sir, he's a well-known philosopher. Oh, it's the police. And he's a brother of an earl. And then the police rushed and saved me. <laughs> <laughs> was this the time that you went to prison, or was that... No, no, that was, no it was the, earlier. Uh, it, well, what exactly did you go to prison for? For writing an article which uh, I was convicted uh, on the ground that this article was intended and likely to cause bad relations between England and the United States because uh, I pointed out how United States troops were used as strike breakers. And I just thought I oughtn't to have done that. Did you plead guilty to the charge? Oh, no. Oh, no, no, I didn't. I said, it's nonsense. If you really think that uh, the United States is going to alter its policy because of an obscure article in a little sheet that nobody reads. <laughs> uh, were you tried by a jury or by a magistrate? By a magistrate. In London? In London. And he said this was the most despicable crime. Yeah. And what did he sentence you to? He sentenced me to six months. And originally it was six months uh, as an ordinary criminal. And then on appeal it was altered to six months in the first division. Which meant more lenient treatment. Oh, very much. It's a profound difference. Now, I have heard it said that at that stage your family were able to pull strings, which led, gave you treatment quite different even from that of normal first division prisoners. Is that true? I should think it's very likely. My brother knew everybody concerned and uh, uh, when uh, the uh, uh, Home Secretary wasn't being very obliging my brother went and see him was, oh, you know, he was my fag at Winchester actually, so he did Now at the time of your own trial and imprisonment do you think looking back that Trinity College behaved either wisely or justly in depriving you of your fellowship? No, certainly not, especially as they did it while the case was sub judice. All the younger fellows had gone to the war, and uh, the government of the college was left to the old boys, and the old boys felt we must do our bit, we can't fight, we're too old, and their bit was to get rid of me. <laughs> now, something very similar to that, of course, happened in the Second World War, when your appointment at the College of the City of New York was terminated. What actually did happen in the Second World War? Oh, in the Second World War, I was completely patriotic. I uh, supported the war, and uh, I was uh, entirely orthodox in my views about that. Nevertheless, you were thrown out of another college at the same age. Ah, but that was for quite different reasons. Uh, that was... Uh, on the ground of my views about marriage and morals. Uh, that was a, a Roman Catholic business. Uh, there was a woman who was intending to send her daughter uh, to the college of the city of New York, uh, where uh, her daughter was not going to study mathematical logic, which was the subject I was going to teach. But nevertheless, this woman professed to be afraid that I should rape her daughter or corrupt her in some way by my mere presence in other classrooms in the same university. And uh, on that ground, she brought an action that I should be deprived of my position. And uh, she accused me of being lewd, lecherous, lascivious, mm. obscene, and aphrodisiac. And all these charges were upheld by the judge in the court, and the judge said that he would therefore annul this appointment. And did she bring any evidence to justify these charges? Yes. Oh.